Hi everybody, welcome to the Stratosphere Studio. On our second attempt here, we, uh, we lost signal, a loss of signal. Uh, spacecraft uh, lost its lock on Earth and the radio antenna was basically just spinning around. We managed to catch it, fortunately stabilized the rotation here at the Stratosphere Studio and it looks like we're back in business. But uh, it went out um, on Twitch and apparently went out on YouTube as well. So um, I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything. Um, so anyway, uh, I, I did get a lot done since um, last time. Uh, I got the suits pretty much the way I like them. I'm pretty happy with the, the metahuman faces. Um, the uh, metahuman animator 2 is um, is very good. It's better. It's much better than than uh, the earlier one. Uh, to really do it right, apparently it needs an iPhone 13 or 14, which I don't have, uh, and what I've been working on all day, or really for the last week and on and off, is to get something that just looks more or less like, um, more or less like I can uh, have something to give you an idea of what the final product's gonna look like. So um, that's uh, what I got. Um, and uh, I was hoping to get, um, I was hoping to get facial animation in there today, but like I said, they changed how they recorded it, and, and it just, it's just not, um, this didn't happen today. So it's gonna look a little um, flat. The thing that really sells this stuff is, I was just trying to get just some eye movement and some lip movement, you know, wasn't trying anything fancy. Just couldn't get it done um, before it was time to roll with this thing. But, on the other hand, um, we do have a, uh, um, uh, so, you know, a video to show. So, um, I'm just going to play it, and here we go. This is a lighting test, by the way. So, um, I thought that was actually not too bad. Um, there's a lot of stuff to finesse on the lighting and all the rest of it. The colors on the suits are crazy saturated, but I actually kind of like that. Um, the, uh, the faces, I think, are good. Um, I did, uh, I did uh, a decent amount of backstory on these uh, four characters. And I'm having major problems with my voice today. Thank you very much. Uh, Eric says they look like bosses and uh, Dave Big Booty said they're walking like men who have, a, who have work to do. Exactly. Um, so I just, I just really raced to get that done before the show today. Um, so uh, actually I wish I could grab a frame. I can't. So what I'll do is I'll just, um, I'll just kind of talk over it for a little bit. And uh, so here we go again. So like I said, I did some backstory work on these guys and trying to figure out, you know, a little bit more about who they were. So uh, Major Mace Mattingly has to be a major. That means, you know, anything but the Navy. Uh, so I'm going to have uh, Major Mace Mattingly be a uh, Air Force major. He's the um, mission commander, base commander, and I think he probably flew F-100s before he uh, took this moon mission. Uh, the guy in yellow there um, is uh, is uh, Doug Davenport. I think. Guy in yellow is a, he's my um, angry voice. He's going to be the one that's just constantly, I'll you know, just cycle this again, hang on. Um, uh, guy in yellow is the guy who's, who I'm going to uh, have be kind of cranking a tankerous, just like me. Uh, he's going to be the one who's going to be saying, oh, you know what? Um, uh, everything's just going to hell down there. And then um, Major Ma uh, Ma Mace Mattingly can kind of, you know, calm things down. So um, Mattingly is an Air Force major. Uh, that would make the guy in yellow, uh, this guy, Doug Davenport, that would make him a uh, lieutenant commander. He's not a pilot. He gets very upset when people call him a pilot. 
he's the mission pilot, but uh, he is of course a naval aviator, and um, and that doesn't uh, that's not something he uh, really likes being called. Um, the guy in blue is um, is Jeff Gordon. They call him Gordo. Kind of a smaller guy. He's from the Navy. He's from Naval Reactors. Um, and uh, he's their chief engineer. He's their nuclear uh, power officer. Uh, and he's certainly the most uh, quiet of the bunch. So um, that guy in blue there is Gordo. He's also a lieutenant commander. Uh, he's the reactor specialist, but he's also the the, the chief engineer and, and in terms of, you know, keeping the, the station running theoretically. And finally, the guy in red um, would be... Uh, I have to keep jumping back to this to restart the movie. Uh, the guy in red would be um, Steve Sinclair, uh, uh, probably Master Sergeant Steve Sinclair. Gave a lot of thought to whether or not um, they uh, would have an enlisted man up there, and I just decided I liked it. And like I said, it's kind of major Matt Masony. So Sinclair is the actual build it guy, um, and uh, and the reason uh, that they all have identical. Uh, walk cycles says uh, well time pair points this out is because up until about four and a half minutes before I recorded this I was still dropping these things on here um, and the other ones that I had just worked for a while and then they didn't so there you go um, and so uh, I actually gave some thought originally to doing one guy from the Air Force one from the Navy one from the Army and one from the Marine Corps but I just couldn't square it um, so the guy in white, Major Mace Mattingly, is Air Force. Uh, the guy in red, I think, is going to be um, uh, a Marine Sergeant or an Air Force Sergeant, maybe Technical Sergeant for the, yeah, probably Air Force uh, Master Sergeant. Guy in blue is a Naval Commander from Naval Reactors, and the guy in uh, yellow is their primary pilot. Oops, I mean uh, Naval Aviator. So um, that's uh, that's getting that. Um, I don't think I've ever shown this footage without somebody saying I should get Zoe to do the voice for this, and I don't think I've ever not said that I cannot do that because the voices have to be recorded at the same time as the facial animation, and that has to be recorded here. So I keep seeing it, and there's, you know, there's just, it's just not going to happen. So that's that. Um, how many weeks so far and we're only at lighting tests? I don't know, Bart. I think it's probably better part of two or three months. That's kind of what life has been like for me for the last two or three months. It's been racing and racing and racing, running faster and faster and faster to try and catch the, the tail end of a train that is moving away quicker than I can catch it. So that's what my life is like right now, and that's what it feels like, and that's why it's taken so long. Um, I mean, I, 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 just, I just don't know what else to say. I, I, I'm here... I'm here weekends, I'm here till 10 or 11 at night, and and this is all I can do by myself. So I'm going as fast as my little feet will carry me. Um, and and uh, believe me, believe me, I don't think there's a day that goes by when I'm not constantly just screaming at myself on how long this takes. I know it's taken forever. and. I get to a point where I've, I, okay, I've got it. I've got it down. I can finally do this. So it's like, nope, 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 no, 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 no. Now, now you're going to have to stop here and you're going to have to spend four days working on this thing. And then you're going to get a half a day's worth of work done. You're going to have to stop and you're going to have to work on this thing. And, and it's just really demoralizing because all of the enthusiasm, you know, that you have for, uh, for getting this thing done is, um, is just bled off by all these technical issues that that just shouldn't be there they just shouldn't happen none of this stuff should happen um it's just it just does wow thank you silver stalker with a with a um with a fifty dollar uh uh super chat here's some dollars for coffee and lozenges love your content i'm getting a lot of hate for chest and those those that still want to take their kids to disney they shelved this movie. How many kids might have been saved? Um, I don't know what that is. Uh, I don't. I don't know who who possibly could be. Um, 
who could still be giving you grief about not taking your kids to Disney. I mean, just Disney has gone. Um, it, it, I, I just, I just can't even, I just can't even say the word anymore, honestly. Um, so, uh, that's, um, that's that. So let's see if we can get through some questions today. as I can. Okay, here we go. Um, just looking at what we got here. Oh, we got a bunch of questions. Let's see if we can get to them. Um, all of a sudden, we're seeing an avatar from Ray Juarez. I think he's got four questions in here. It's good to see you, Ray. Thank you very much for the questions. And, um, and uh, it's always nice to see uh, new people in, in the forum. Um, and he's also helping to curate it, so uh, thank you. So here's a question from Ray Suarez. Hello, Mr. Woodall. Hello, Ray. Please call me Bill. I have two questions. This is the one I'm more interested, invested in. Feel free to skip my second one unless you have time and have answered anyone else's questions first. Question, when in more casual conversation like at work, how would you go about providing criticisms or praise for movies that you think are bad or are good, as well as political conversations? I'm a poor conversationalist, but I want to get better at voicing points in a way that is not preaching. What a profound question that is. It's a really, really excellent question. Um, the, the, boy, I don't even know where to start on that one. Entire reason of the only, the, the entire reason of having this whole en entertainment aspect of it is to is to defang the political aspect of it. People are so are so deep in their trenches now. Everybody is so so um, ammoed up and, and and dug in and and uh, you know seeing red politically smokes coming out of everybody's ears. This is all intentional. I'm not going to get into the politics of that on the Monday night show, but. The entire idea of of doing something other than me standing there and telling people things is to not only reach people who uh, we might not have reached before for no other reason than the eye candy, but also to get around the algorithm, but also um, to to take to take the message someplace that feels like neutral ground. I'm still going for the win. I'm still going to be, my objective is exactly the same as it would be if I was doing a firewall or whatever the case may be. I'm just trying to find a way to sneak past the, the defenses, not just the technical, uh, technological defenses that they put up to make sure that um, young people and, and others don't get to hear uh, any other opinion than the one they want. But also, even if they do get a chance to see it, especially if they get a chance to see it, um, you have to, I, I want to do something that is at least on the surface funny enough and neutral enough, and playful is the word I'm looking for, playful enough so that you can sneak a discussion in there without, without it becoming political. Um, when I was talking about the characters a few moments ago, the reason um, 
I mentioned that guy in yellow. And the reason he's walking behind everybody else is he's just he's just one of he's just me in in a typical day. Um, he's he's the kind of guy that's getting the feed same feed as everybody else, and he's just saying that this, these, these things are just going to hell in a handbasket, and, you know, and and he's just constantly bitching about things. So I get to get that out of the system, but then I also get. Um, to have a different voice in this, which is really, as I told Natasha, it's really her voice, which is the, you know, you try and see it from their point of view. Seeing something from their point of view doesn't mean agreeing with them. And it certainly doesn't mean changing your mind or lowering your standards. It means just trying to understand what what people think is the truth or what people think is the case or whatever. And so I decided that I wanted Mattingly to be much more... Um, I'll go with my first impulse on this, more gentle, uh, you know, more um, disciplined, more fatherly, more um, reasoned and balanced. Uh, you know what, I, here's what I want. I want him to be, um, I want him to be Andy Taylor is what I want him to be. Uh, I want him to be more than that, but I want him to be that. Uh, from uh, Mayberry, um, from, from the uh, Andy Griffith show. Um, so, if you have a mitigating voice in there, you can get away with things, at least get them out there, without people just smashing the off button and rage quitting, because you're presenting their side of the argument as well. Now. As I told Natasha, we've had this discussion so many times. I have it practically every day. Every time I see something about this or that, I just think, oh, blah, 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 blah. and then she'll say, well, you know, it's just different, and they're different, and, then, and they, they're good at different things. Well, they can't read, and they can't blah, 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 blah. Um, So, look, it's not going to be even-handed. If, e if, if it was even-handed, there'd be no point in doing it. The entire reason for having this and trying to address your question here is it's 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 an act of disarmament it's it's a way for people to get their to just get their defenses down enough so that you can sneak something in there and if you can do it with humor then you the 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 objective i've been going for and i've been going for it for five freaking months now is i want I want to be able to say something sharp and funny because that's my knee-jerk reaction to this stuff. Uh, I, I see these guys doing a fair amount of reaction videos. Um, the, 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 tra the trailer line, which I've essentially got all the elements for now, the trailer line is, um, you know, you see Dylan Mulvaney on the 70s TV and it's like, see, this is what happens, you know, little, little boys play with cap guns. So I've seen a lot of things like body cam footage of people being pulled over and just, you know, arguing with the cops. Get out of the car. Why? You know, well, you got, because you need to get out of the car right now. Why? You explain to me why. We're not dealing with... You, you finally run into something that you're not going to talk your way out of here. So... So with, with this guy... Um, with... Uh, with Doug, he, he can he can just be cantankerous without the, that that's where I'm going just trying to find it. By making one of the characters cantankerous, I can be cantankerous without the entire series being cantankerous. I can have a guy who just likes to bitch about things. And if he's gonna be bitching about things, he'd better be clever and he'd better be competent. He better be really, really good at his job, because that's the only way you can you can justify this without the character becoming just a just a drag. Right? So this guy is a is a Sierra hotel pilot, and he is just tired of hearing about things like well you can't fly without computers. So so he's going to go out there and he's going to just show everybody for the sake of it what you can do without computers. And he's angry when people say you can't do this without computers because it's a violation of his entire life. It's his, 
that's his entire life was is, is to be a pilot. And now there's oh you can't do that without you know, it makes him angry when he hears that. And he can say some, some sharp and funny things. And then you can have Mace come in and, uh, oh my goodness, astronaut said, Dr. Smith, no, we will not be having Dr. Smith on this moon base. And then Mace can come in and, and, and just not change it, just just kind of pat it down just a little bit, you know, just a little bit. Uh, come on, you know, come on, uh, Doug, you know, these guys. Um, no, it's all they know, you know. It's it's all they've got. Some of the technologies are just wonderful. Uh, so when when you start thinking about the kind of points you want to make with this thing politically, yeah, Archie Bunker in space, yeah, I mean, yeah, he's, he's 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 sharper than Archie Bunker. He's, I, I think probably I'm looking more for like a kind of a Tony Stark kind of a swagger, uh, is what I'm looking for. I think with this guy with the, with this. Uh, naval aviator he's a fighter pilot and you know that's what fighter pilots use for birth control is their personalities so um so he's going to be that guy mace is going to be I, I really would i mean i really have high hopes and plans for this because the writing part of it is going gangbusters in terms of the stories and the scripts and all the other things that i want to do and 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 i just get so I just get so bloody gutted by just again and again and again. I say, why, why is this doing this? Why, 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 why is this so hard? You know, the, the, this the software is amazing. This uh, Unreal Engine Five, but to take a metahuman head and put it on another body and have them walk together and do it, it's like it's like it's like Chinese calculus. It's just. It's unbelievable, and when you look at the the tutorials, it's like, well, you have to do this. You have to go into the into the blueprint, go into the blueprint, and check this box here. Great, do that. Okay, then you have to take this little node in the blueprint, and you have to replace it with this node, and set this value to one. And and, and I'm doing all these things, and I'm thinking, okay, I can do this, but can't you just do it? You know, can't you just say I'd like the body to be attached to the head, and so that when the head, and so that when the body moves, the head goes with it, and it doesn't, you know, swing around and do all this other stuff. Is that so hard? Apparently, it is. So. They've done miracles, miracles, with the with the the vision, and I'm not asking them to make it for idiots. But it seems to me that somebody at Epic should be thinking about how to make this for people who are not game developers, because game developers are all they just do this without even thinking about it; it's just automatic. But they have a much bigger audience than that, much bigger sales base if they if they decide to go for it. Um, so so anyway, as far as your so, trying to get to your question here. Um, what struck me about the the question when I first read it was um, was uh, how do you go about providing criticism and praise for movies that you think are bad or good as well as political conversations so I guess that's where I'm trying to go with this uh, Ray um, I, I think the entire idea is how do you how can you talk about politics without talking about politics that's kind of that's kind of where I'm going um, you can tell people things or you can show them things and you know this is this is it. And I don't for a second, I don't for a second mean to compare uh, this in terms of scale possibility or anything else. I'm just using it as an example. So it's not like I have delusions of megalomania. But with that said, I don't know how many millions and millions and millions of young men out there who's only how many men there are out there, young men and older boys, who, how, who are out there, who the only father figure they have in their entire lives is, uh, is Master Chief from Halo, you know? I mean, I, I, just, I just keep seeing it. I keep hearing people talking about Master Chief that way. And I'm sure the woke uh, battalions, having destroyed everything else in their path, will find a way to make Master Chief gay or or decide to become trans or whatever, and that point, at which point he won't be Master Chief anymore. But 
uh, that this this virtual world is becoming more and more virtual. I'm seeing things like apps and, and websites where now you can go in there and this is what they're advertising. You can have AI design you this, this perfect girlfriend and that's one thing, okay, I get how that works. But they're also saying, you know, and, and she'll be your best friend and she'll be, and, and she'll be able to provide, um, the, the, uh, and she's a great conversationalist, I think is, is the term. Um, so, you got to get in, in there with that. As far as your question about the movies go, good and bad movies, box office doesn't lie. You know, it, the box office is independent of uh, political bias to a large degree. I mean, there are movies that, you know, progressives will go see because of the message, and there's message movies for conservatives, although not nearly as many. But generally speaking, the huge bulk of the middle doesn't really care unless the politics get too intrusive, at which point they do start to care. So what So what do we see with these movies in the larger culture? Over the, not just over the last couple of days or years, even really over the last practically almost a decade now. What we find is that the more political they try to make movies, the less effective those movies are. And this is something I didn't really realized until just this minute, not quite so clearly, that what these what these progressives have done is in their in their orgy to smash that smash that message into you and their inability to have real life experiences enough to make them into real writers and give the characters they love in you know give them faults and arcs and all the rest of it it's actually kind of interesting what they've done is as they get more and more and more political they get less and less and less effective because the we got ourselves into this trouble because Hollywood was able to put extremely liberal messages into films that didn't seem like a liberal message and, and, and were in fact tremendously entertaining, you know. Uh, the Easy Rider is, you know, it's an anti-hero movie. Um, and so is Bonnie and Clyde. And, and so when you have these, there are movies, they become franchises only because the movie is so successful, only because they ring that bell. Right? I don't know. I could probably write 50 pages on the difference between Star Wars and Ice Pirates, but I, even then, I don't think I could put my finger on what the difference between them is, why one of them changed the culture and why the other one just didn't. But when you when you ring that bell like that, um, you're 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 really you're really connecting to people on a deep level, and that's why Star Wars becomes franchise and Star Trek and all, you know, Marvel, Mar you know the, the um, all of it, and these things become so popular and so widespread that the left realize they're a they're a delivery system, that all we have to do is inject our message into the stuff that people are eating anyway. It's kind of like we're just going to, you know, inject some cyanide into some jelly donuts. People like jelly donuts. They don't like cyanide. Uh, but if you put some in there, then they'll take it and, and mission accomplished. Only it doesn't work that way. It, it, you can't put the cyanide in the jelly donut without it's tasting like a cyanide donut. And so people have just walked away from it. The Indiana Jones catastrophe, I mean, Crystal Skull was an abomination. And, and embarrassing, that was what, 15 years ago? This thing is, 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 a, is a certified flop. And everything that they do is a certified flop. The Little Mermaid's a certified flop. All of it is just plain not making money. I'm not gonna get into the whole ESG thing and all the back end of that stuff, but, but it, just in terms of the movies, they are not, they are, they have, in their enthusiasm to bash home the message, they have unmasked themselves and the generation or two or three or who am I kidding more like four or five generations of left-wing writers who are actual writers who are great writers they just there aren't the conditions to make great writers are not here anymore 
I'm not saying there aren't any great writers here. I'm saying there's a lot fewer of them than there was when I was a kid. And there's a lot fewer when I was a kid compared to people who went through actual real trauma, you know? So we have, of all the things about these woke movies, the thing that is so really astonishing to me, and, and I hear um, Drinker talking about this all the time, although I don't think he quite gets the political objective completely, uh, is that it, it's really astonishing how little talent and ability these woke writers have. They really genuinely are, they're not even, they're not even like a parasite or a leech or a remora because those things, or a tick or a flea, those things stay on the body for a while, you know? They get to know their host. They basically become one with their host. These people just land on these properties. It's like, have you ever written Indiana Jones before? Nah. Do you know anything about the history of the character? He wears a hat and he's got a whip, right? So we'll just put some whip stuff in there and everybody will love it. And they, and they just don't have a clue. And um, I'm not the only person to have noticed that, that these movies are being written by younger and produced and, 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 and directed by younger and younger and younger people. And so when you have the inevitable consequence of a successful franchise and you want to just keep drinking the milk out of that forever, those characters are going to get older. And the people who are making the movies about old characters now, like Luke Skywalker and Harrison Ford, I don't mean old in the sense of played out, although there's certainly that. I mean, people who are in their 60s, 70s, in the case of Harrison Ford in his 80s, they don't know how to write old people. They Their, their vision... Just look at look at this last Harrison Ford movie. Look at this last vision of Indiana Jones, and look at the last vision of Luke Skywalker, or the the last vision of um, Blade Runner, which I admit is not a upbeat, peppy kind of thing. But all they see when they see people getting older, people just lonely, bitter, angry. Life has passed them by. Time for somebody their age, meaning in their twenties or whatever to show them how to do it right and and the arrogance of this and the and the just the stupidity of it is overwhelming and they really think that if it's got indiana jones it's got the hat and stuff then um then uh then they'll just make a ton of money but it's not i think blade runner it too is excellent i like it too eric it's just that decker doesn't end up particularly happy and I, as i qualified that decker's not exactly Indiana Jones, although I guess he is in a sense, uh, but nevertheless, um, they don't know how to. They don't know how to. They, they're handed icons, and they don't even. It's like they're handed a, a, like a brass genie bottle. They don't even rub the lamp, you know. And I just put up on the shelf, and and so they just go through and destroying things. Now I did have, I did have. Um, a uh, a very interesting idea. It's not not for me specifically, but just kind of culturally. I did not see Anna Jones. I'm certainly not going to go see the the Dial of Destiny. I'm not even interested in seeing clips. However, um, with the trailer everywhere and everybody talking about how awful the movie is, I got a chance to see a couple of you know frames from the trailer. And Apparently, in Dial of Destiny, it opens with Indiana Jones in the 40s, they, and they de-aged Harrison Ford. And, it, and I've heard people say there's moments when it's a little, a little off, but generally speaking, it looks really good. The, the, the clips I saw you know, on the trailer were like, wow, okay. Um, you know, that's... I believe it. I believe it. Um, so... What I'm getting at is everybody who loves Star Wars thinks that Star Wars is over. Everybody that loved Indiana Jones, everybody that loved, I guess, go down the list. But with this digital technology, with this deep fake, because de aging essentially is deep fake, it occurred to me that we are, if we're, we're there already. But it occurred to me that we are now at the point where fans could make a movie 
about Luke Skywalker being 50 or 60 years old and they could use Mark Hamill's face. Now, I'm not going to deal with the legal issues or anything like that, but just think about it. It would be possible to make... It would be possible, in, in fact, by today's standards, relatively straightforward to make the original series... Star Trek, the original series, there, the sets exist. There's one that's just incredible, and there's another one that's very good. But the one um, that, that um, Vic used on uh, Star Trek Continues is it's indistinguishable from the from the um, actual set used in 66 or 68. So just stick with me for a second here. If you had somebody like like um, um, like Vic, who was the right size and had the right mannerisms, you could you could deep fake not only deep fake Shatner's face onto onto this character, you could deep fake his voice, and again you'd want somebody who knew Shatnerisms, but it's entirely within our grasp technologically to be able to make new episodes of Star Trek featuring William Shatner, Leonard Nimoy, DeForest Kelly at the ages that they were in 1966. And when I realized that, I thought, man, I don't know. This, this raping of the culture that's been done this this destruction, deconstruction and destruction of Luke Skywalker and 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 you know Indiana Jones, bitter guy, got a divorce, uh, accused of murder apparently, uh, nothing to do but stand around and look old, and wait for the um, young um, British uh, Supergirl, uh, you know, bestest ever, um, Wonder Child, to. Car literally carry him. This little stick of a girl is carrying him around, apparently. And, and you know, okay, you can have your wish fulfillment, and people have voted with their wallets on what they think about your wish fulfillment. Nobody cares anymore, Kathleen Kennedy. We know that you got a lot of issues, and we know you're not happy that you had to make coffee, and we know your entire life is predicated on getting revenge on all these men for all the years that you had to live in the terrible squalor of the top levels of Hollywood filmmaking. And so, yes, you have ruined the official version of Star Wars. You've ruined the, the canonical Star Wars. You turned Luke Skywalker into an angry, bitter, loser, murderer. And that was not accidental. You did that on purpose. And everybody grieved about it. But we are now very, very close to being able to say essentially screw you Kathleen Kennedy the fans will make the uh, the fans will make the continuing story of Luke Skywalker and we'll just say that that guy on the island just didn't exist and it's easy just take away the beard take away the beard and you got a whole new Luke and you have and you can everybody was saying when we you know when the um, Force Awakens came out oh man you know we didn't um, we had a chance to get Carrie Fisher, um, Harrison Ford, Mark Hamill on the same uh, shot, and we didn't do it. And everybody was very sad about that. But we can do it now. And, um, and that opens up tremendous potential. I really looked at the, at the de-aging of Harrison Ford and said to myself, we could make hair, we could make India the the, 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 the problem with the, 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 the trilogy, right? Indiana Jones trilogy is the trilogy. Crystal Skull doesn't count. Dial Destiny doesn't count. Nobody wants to see it. They didn't want to see it 15 years ago and they don't want to see it now. But you could make, at least theoretically, you could make more Indiana Jones movies that are set in the late 1930s or the early 40s because it's not a question of Harrison Ford getting too old anymore. And it's not a, even a question of getting a different actor, which is also not quite the same thing. I am, having looked at that de-aging thing I, and, and listening to where they're going with AI voices as well, I'm actually thinking I might, really might like to write like a definitive Star Trek original series episode just one maybe you go out and shoot that thing and um, 
and and just have Kirk, Spock, and McCoy uh, be Kirk, Spock, and McCoy. And uh, by the way, um, uh, the Spock on Strange New Worlds is like I've never imagined. We've seen Black Vulcans, we've seen Women Vulcans, we've seen all kinds of different Vulcans, uh, but we've never seen nerdy Vulcans before. But the guy who plays Spock on, 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 on that is, to me, the biggest nothing burger that has ever walked the earth. I mean, at least Zachary um, Kinto had, he had character, he had, you know, there was something to him. This guy, it's like the, it's like the guy, it's like the guy, it's like they had to shoot a scene and there was a guy who was in craft services who was bringing the sandwiches around and said, dude, we need you to step in here and be uh, Mr. Spock. Can you do that? Well, so. you know, there you go. But you could make all of them. You could do all of these things. And, and now you don't have to worry about the aging problem because you're not going to try and, oh, we got to make one more movie while Harrison Ford is still with us. And that brings up a different issue and somewhat different issue. And this is something I've been aware of for quite a while now. I'm wondering when we're going to see the next movie starring Marilyn Monroe. Because you yeah, have mediocre Vulcans, infidel. When are we going to see the next movie? That It's not a cameo by Marilyn Monroe. It's not like, oh look, here's a person playing Marilyn Monroe on a stage. I mean, we could do, right now, we could make a new movie starring Marilyn Monroe because Marilyn Monroe um, is a is an image it's an iconic image but it's an image nobody watching this knew Marilyn Monroe and I'm not entirely sure Marilyn Monroe knew Marilyn Monroe um, but what makes Marilyn Monroe or Elvis or, or James Dean or any of these other icons I mean, you really got to get to the get down to the, the the philosophy of it. All of these things are essentially just they're just flat. They're just images on a flat screen. And so, while you could make a movie right now, starring Marilyn Monroe, and certainly within the next few years at the latest, be absolutely indistinguishable from her just walking out of the you know makeup room in 1964. The question is, is there anybody who could write a Marilyn Monroe movie? Because because what she, what Marilyn Monroe is is this um, it's like a mythological ideal. And 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 there, Marilyn Monroe has her own rules. If you were to go to if you were to if you were to make a new Marilyn Monroe movie with the technology, the writer would have to know what the rules are for Marilyn Monroe. And if they didn't, and if they and, and that's going to likely be the case, we're not going to have any idea. They're going to probably make her into a swearing, tattooed, you know, ass-kicking warrior. That's probably what they'll do. But that's not Marilyn Monroe. They would have to, and and uh, and uh, Quibo says that they'd have to make her. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, said so that they Hollywood would have to make her modern looking. I think if you make Marilyn Monroe modern looking, it's not Marilyn Monroe anymore. I really just, I, I just can't imagine it. Um, so. We have an incredible frontier of technology that is just now beginning to sink in, to me anyway, in terms of not what we can do technically, but what we can do culturally. Um, Eric Blake says, Marilyn herself laid it out for a journalist one time. They were walking down the street, and she pointed out that no one seemed to be noticing them. Now watch this. She started the walk, and just like that, people started walking people walking by started double taking and going is that oh my god that is yeah and the same thing for captain kirk and all the rest so anyway i just think it's good news because i i don't want the final i don't want my final um image of 
Luke Skywalker to be, you know, just disappearing off a rock on an island someplace. And when they brought Luke back, and the technology's improved quite a lot since then, but when they brought Luke back for um, Mandalorian, people went bat guano crazy over it because they realized, wait a minute now, wait a minute, we can still, we could make as many movies about Luke Skywalker as we really wanted to. And I mean like Luke Skywalker. What's even interesting, even more interesting than that is, since you can de-age characters and age them digitally, once you've got the basics of Mark Hamill's face, you could make movies about Luke Skywalker as a hundred year old man. You could make a movie about Sky Luke Skywalker as a 14 year old boy. And it would look exactly like Mark Hamill every time. You wouldn't have to do that kind of, okay, I'm gonna pretend that, um, you know, that uh, Chris Pine is, is actually Captain Kirk. I'm, no, I don't have to pretend I'm gonna get William Shatner to do it. Uh, and then somebody mentioned Arlie Ermey. He, he'd be fun to bring back. Uh, it almost sounds a bit like, you know, who framed Roger Rabbit, but there would be, there'd be something to this idea of having a, a movie that was just about the icons. A bit like, a bit like um, Ready Player One, except, you know, entertaining. Anyway, I hope that, I hope that helped. Um, so Ray was kind enough to say, don't do any others until you come back. I will do that. Okay, so from Chris Taylor. Sorry, I was on vacation for the Dyson Sphere discussion. We talked about Dyson Spheres and how much material it would take and all the rest of it. The usual proposed purpose for a Dyson Sphere or Swarm is to maximize the solar energy collection from the star, which does not require nearly the same mass as constructing a giant inside-out pseudo-planet. Using only the metal contained in Mercury, you could make a thin reflector a couple of thousandths of an inch thick at one astronomical unit radius, thicker than even current solar reflector technology. It's an interesting point. In practice, it would not be one piece for orbital mechanic reasons, and I personally think that solar power sats should be as close to the sun as the material properties permit and beam the power back to Earth by a laser to take advantage of the inverse square law. I'll agreed on all this. The high power long range lasers would also be useful for planetary defense, pushing light sails, etc. That's also very interesting. Extreme inner system power satellites might make interesting infrastructure defense facilities for the colonies. Reaching them might be hard due to the need to kill so much delta V going that deep into the well, and then the fact that they could use the constant radiation pressure on their collectors to orbit at velocities slower than normal for their orbital radius. My god, man, this is really wonderful. With their huge laser emitter diameters, they could easily outrange any ship-mounted laser except possibly a coordinated swarm operating as a phased array or someone using a gravity lens somehow. Well, damn, man, that was about as epic a science fiction question as ever been, has ever been asked. Also, the easier place to get the mass for a Dyson Sphere may be mine the largest deposit of metal in the solar system, the sun. There's an interesting paper in 2017 on star mining that wouldn't be outside uh, a near our Kardashev 1 civilization capability by GL uh, Matloff, and here's a link. I will mine the sun to, um, to build our uh, Dyson Sphere. There's certainly enough matter in the sun to do that. The, the, here's the question I have about this, though. Uh, the, the, it's a, it was an extraordinarily enlightening uh, question. Really, really interesting and deep question. My question is, what do you need that kind of energy for? I mean, I, I just, certainly by that point, you would think you could just put a, a reactor wherever you needed it, or as many as you needed. I understand that's not gonna match the output of the sun. And you, I know also this whole science fiction thing about, well, this is a, you know, if you're, you know, there's a, a galactic level civilization, there's a level of civilization where you, um, the, these these names you mentioned, I've never been a big fan of them. Um, but what do you do with all of that? Um, that's not that's not the kind of that's not the kind of project you would do to keep running your air conditioning. You know, what what? Now, I suppose it's possible that it would that you would need that much energy to open wormholes and all the rest of it. I just find the idea to be something that doesn't really make a lot of sense to me personally. I'm not saying the physics is wrong. 
I'm not saying that the idea is invalid. I'm just saying operationally, I just don't know what you would, what you could possibly need that you couldn't get much easier for that kind of energy. And this is when this is when people will say, well, we have no idea how much energy that kind of a super advanced society needs. Maybe, maybe, but maybe they're able to build machines that run on body heat, right? I mean, we don't really know. There's a lot of there's a lot of ideas that seem that are interesting philosophical ideas and they become great science fiction ideas because they appeal to us but when you try to think about them practically, everybody thinks about how practically you mean like building one. I mean, practically, like, why would you build one? What could you, what could you do with that much energy? What would, you, what would you possibly need it for? Now, I understand this could be very much like somebody saying in the, in the 1810s or something, my God, man, you're talking about a one megawatt electrical plant. That's enough energy for the rest of the planet for the rest of the time. I understand that, but generally speaking, the more advanced the technology gets, the less energy it uses. Although there is, the tech multiplies faster than the than the reduction. Um, so I'm just trying to think what I would do with that kind of unlimited energy, and I can't. I can't think of anything. Um, Sad Wings Raging in YouTube says, my favorite is the space elevator, as if that wouldn't wobble the Earth off its axis and disturb the planet. I think the space elevator is mass is so insignificant compared to the mass of the Earth. I don't think anyone's, I don't think there's much chance of destabilizing the Earth's rotation. And on the, contrary to uh, the Dyson sphere, space elevator is a, is a real, real good idea. I don't think people fully understand how much time it would take. I mean, 60 miles, 70 miles, let's say. You probably could do it in under an hour. Um, what happens to... I guess... What happens to... Uh, to your body weight when you're riding a space elevator. I guess as you move along the radius, the, yeah, so if the space elevator itself is the radius to the departure point, and as you move along that radius, that radius is rotating with the Earth, so the further out you go on that space elevator radius, the more circular energy and speed you have because they talk about tethered asteroids because you need something on the other end of it to kind of keep it tight but you're still presumably could get off of the top of a space elevator walk out the door and just float in orbit right that gets you to orbit so where does that acceleration come from am I missing something here let's just think this through I get in a space elevator, got it, and it's built in carbon fiber, nanofibers, got it. And it's got a little car that goes from ground level up to, let's say, for the sake of it, the orbit of the space station. So 16, 17,000 miles an hour. My physical body, relative to the surface of the planet, is zero. But once I get higher and higher and higher, I will be at the departure end. I should be well if, it, if it's going to be in orbit. I'm going to I'm going to have to pick up 16,500 miles an hour of velocity. So has anybody done the numbers on this? Has anybody thought about this? I'm not saying I'm like the first to think about it, but I've never heard anybody talk about it before. Because you just get in the elevator, you go up, right? Everybody has an elevator experience that they can talk about. I get in, I push up. This time it's just a really, really tall elevator. But you have to come out with orbital velocity. you got to be going 17,000 miles an hour at the other end of that. Huh. 
that's an interesting thought. I'm, I'm sure there's a much simpler explanation. Bart Stretcher said, space elevators, your body weight would drop to zero as you get to the top. But the but zero gravity is not the absence of gravity. It's a, an object at the space station isn't at zero G because it's out of the reach of the pull of the Earth. It's at zero G because it's in free fall around the Earth. It's not, you don't get weightless because you get further away from the Earth. You get weightless because you move fast enough to keep falling over the edge of the earth. You're in a state of perpetual fall. So for this thing to be useful, the top of it has to be in some orbit, let's just say a, a 17,000 mile an hour orbit, whatever that height is. You load your junk on the bottom, you take it up to the top, push it off onto a spacecraft, it fires its rockets and off it goes. So how do how does that crate pick up 17,000 miles an hour of energy? I understand that I understand where it would get it. It's not that I don't understand it. I know that as it goes further and further up the up the elevator, it's it's taking more and more and more radial component. But has anybody ever done the math on this? Because it seems to me like you would be pinned against the trailing edge of that space elevator. Now, this is not my strong suit. So I might be completely wrong, but I haven't heard anybody talk about that. Hey, we have a first time chat from um, somebody with a pale uh, from Vector Death. Well, okay. Even with the low temps of 70 degrees, we are getting hit by waves from space that heat metal in humans. For example, 70 degree day, but the car door burns you when you touch it. We're being hit by some type of different wave from space right now. Could be a supernova from tens of thousands of years ago and just reaching the Earth now would be nice to know. Yeah, um, I think most of the uh, temperature uh, and radiation that's sitting there is coming from the sun, but there's that constant discussion about what happens if uh, Betelgeuse goes supernova. I don't think we're in fatal range of it, but that's a that's another thing to uh, to find yourself not worrying about because it's not really too much you can do about that. Um, just checking here before we move on. Dave Big Booty says the ISS would move at 17,000 miles per hour relative to the space elevator. Then what's the point of the space elevator? It's a, yeah, Air Techie says it's a giant lever. That's, that's it, it's like a throwing stick, essentially. Something to think about. Okay, um, I had not really uh, thought about that too much. And let's see, moving on. Marusha Dark, topic for getting a tip for getting over depression. Oh, hooray. Hey, Bill, I hope this post finds you in better spirits than last week. P probably not. No question for me, but I did want to share a tip with you in case you ever find yourself in a dark place again and can't get yourself out. Managed to do it so far, but I'm uh, take all the advice I can get. Something I learned years ago, which is to try to stop doing whatever you're doing as soon as you become aware of the situation and put on a, multi a motivating or uplifting piece of music. Yes, this is more than just a psychological trick. The vibrations actually have a physiological impact on your body as well. Getting your heart rate up, blood flowing and leading to holistic healing. It might make a couple of songs before you begin to feel the effect, but definitely has to be something that's personally meaningful to you. I find it works just fine about works just about every time. Some of my go-tos are Burning Heart, Danger Zone, Eye of the Tiger, or Tasto's The Business if you need recommendations. Also food. Food always helps for much the same reason. Happy Fourth of May. Live long and prosper. Maru, thank you very much. That's very, very kind of you. Uh, so all of it, the advice and the uh, and the sentiment behind it. Um, yes. Playing, playing the kind of music that I used to like really does uh, get my... Um, my blood pressure and my mood up, but one I think the thing for me that has proven to be the most effective non-medicinal um, weapon uh, is um, is the comedy, just the YouTube comedy. For example, so I can't remember honestly if it was last night or the night before, but it was no longer ago than that. 
um, I I become convinced that the money that the funniest man who ever lived I think John Cleese is the second funniest man alive I think the funniest man alive is Paul Whitehouse I genuinely think he's the funniest man who ever lived uh, hardly anybody knows who he is he's one of the two people on the queer sketch on on Harry and Paul so I'd been a fan of uh, Paul Whitehouse and um, uh, oh come on Harry Enfield and uh, Paul Whitehouse. And so I'd seen just about everything that they did. I've seen every Harry and Paul episode. I've seen all the previous episodes back when it was the Harry Enfield show. I saw about as much um, Paul Whitehouse as I thought I could find. And then I stumbled upon The Fast Show, which is a show. He, so he stopped working with Harry Enfield for a while, did this thing called The Fast Show. It was a lot like grazing, very quick sketches. And, and there's a... a like like other British sitcoms or, or sketch shows, they are just completely in love with this recurring sketch where it's essentially the same gag done again and again and again. It really somehow works. It doesn't seem like it should, but it does. Um, so one of the gags I saw was Suit You, Sir, which is a couple of tailors who've got this just completely bizarre kind of sexual talking uh, you get with people um, who uh, who come into the shop and that's just a character study he somebody had assembled a series of sketches that Paul Whitehouse did on the, the fast show about a character called unlucky Alf and he is an old man in England his wife has died, he's living alone, and he's constantly talking about how unlucky he is. And he is. And it's all self-inflicted. And, and I started watching it, the first, so this came, took place over several episodes. So the first like little, little encounter with Unlucky Alf was he's on the roof of his little home and he's talking about he's talking straight to the camera and he's got this really thick accent he says, so i built me a little i built me a little greenhouse you know to keep me flowers warm and um and uh and he says but the problem is i'm so worried that these kids are gonna um that these kids are gonna throw their cricket balls and hit the glass on my greenhouse and ruin my greenhouse. I've just got a bad feeling about that. So, the second he finished saying that, a cricket ball comes sailing over the roof, misses the greenhouse, Alf picks it up, goes to throw it back to the kids, and then on the throw, he throws the cricket ball into, um, into, uh, the greenhouse and breaks the windows he's got is it look I apparently have lost the streams there's nothing wrong with my internet um, but I'm not starting this again so uh, for those of you who are watching this recording um, we just lost the live stream I'm very tired uh, my voice is given out. We've only done an hour, but um, we lost uh, uh, Twitch and we lost YouTube. And uh, it's not my end. We got good internet here. I got green lights on everything. I don't know why, but it did. So um, this one's going to come to a, a rapid uh, ending. Um, Anyway, uh, that's, that'll do it for this edition of the um, Stratosphere Studio because I just don't really, I don't know, it's just strange doing this without some kind of feedback. So, um, uh, Truncated Show, we can thank our, uh, our insect overlords for that. Uh, but anyway, uh, if you get a chance uh, to watch um, uh, anything by Paul Whitehouse, Paul Whitehouse and Harry Enfield are brilliant together, but Paul Whitehouse is amazing. And Paul Whitehouse does a, a like a 18 or 20 in, sketch installment called um, it's 
is it Harry and Fred? No. It's about a. It's about Paul Whitehouse plays an Irish laborer on this giant country estate, and and the relationship between this guy and the guy. It, it's a. It's a rich, rich man, poor man, constant sort of perpetual, deep discomfort. But it's it's funny, and then and then it becomes like unbelievably poignant. I gotta find it. It's uh, just so you can have the name of it. I cannot recommend this highly enough. Uh, it's uh, something. What's the guy's name? Hang on a second. But Paul Paul Whitehouse is the funniest man alive. Um, so just let me find that, and then we'll wrap it up here. Here it is. Ted and Ralph. Ted and Ralph. Yeah. Ted is the uh, is the uh, British uh, lower class guy, and Ralph is the uh, is the very 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 unhappy and brilliantly acted brilliantly acted um, owner of this gigantic house, and he has no friends. He's all alone. The only person he talks to is his gardener basically his groundskeeper and the um i don't know how to describe it uh I'm trying to remember this actor's name um he does such a an unbelievably poignant job of it it's just he's so uncomfortable his 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 skin is crawling off his body he's the guy who played bunny on the choir sketches and he's just so good at this oh, i should know his name by heart by now I'll, I'll certainly work on it hang on um michael something i think there's white house and white house's accent his irish accent is just beyond belief and it is it is such a moving story there's so there's charlie higson he's tremendous these two these two guys together charlie higson and um paul whitehouse uh ted and ralph um it's just a a masterpiece masterpiece um so anyway here i am talking to myself so i'm gonna uh i'm gonna wrap this thing up and um and thank our members for making this show possible and uh we will see you on uh thursday uh, right here for the Stratosphere Lounge. Sometimes the uh, bear gets you, you know. That's the way it goes. <laughs>